As we start our service this evening, would you like to turn in your Bibles to Psalm 130? Psalm 130, a song of ascents. Out of the depths I cry to you, Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to my cry for mercy. If you, Lord, kept a record of sins, Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, so that we can with reverence serve you. I wait for the Lord, my whole being waits, and in his word I put my hope. I wait for the Lord more than watchmen wait for the morning, more than watchmen wait for the morning. Israel, put your hope in the Lord, for with the Lord is unfailing love, and with him is full redemption. He himself will redeem Israel from all their sins. So this is a psalm that would have been sung by the pilgrims going up to Jerusalem. And it's a reminder that we come to the holy and just God as sinners. And we can come to the holy and just God as sinners, that he is a God who redeems his people. And uh, here is a man who is in deep distress, really. Uh, he is calling out for mercy because he recognizes and understands the depths of his sin. And so he comes to God. And that, too, is what we should do, that we are sinners, that we, too, need to turn to the Lord that we wait in hope for the Lord. We wait in hope for the Lord in the sense not only that he will be our help day by day, that we can see that help, but we also wait in hope for the day of the Lord's return when full redemption comes. I don't know if uh, some of you, I, I think, may have been in the, in the services or uh, have been on shift work. Um, I remember the times that I, I was... Uh, on duty and uh, uh, doing an, a, a sort of duty watch during the night. And it is long and it is tiring just sitting there waiting, waiting. And so I can understand that uh, he, he, he knows and understands more than watchmen wait for the morning, the dangers that come or potentially might come at night. And how long, how they long for the daylight when they can see and be clear and understand what's going on when the busyness of the day starts rather than just the, the boredom of a night watch. But the Lord will return. And that's what we'll be thinking about through our service this, this evening, that we wait in hope for the Lord, for the day of his return. Well, over at Hyde Heath, um, Two Sundays ago, we had Sazra visit us. And we had um, the scripture reader from RF Northolt come, Steve Doherty. Um, and he's settled well into the work, despite the fact that he still hasn't got his security pass. He's been allowed access to the base. And um, they're waiting, therefore, for security and for uh, a home on the base. But uh, he's got good relationships with the um, the uh, chaplain there, and uh, they're they're holding a, a a weekly tea and toast event, which, which they're inviting people to come in, and that's proving po profitable. So he's witnessing not only to RF personnel, but there are army people based on uh, RF Northolt as well. So I thought I'd share that with you. Uh, good to it would be good to pray for him. Well, Heather's going to come and bring our reading to us now, and that is Matthew chapter 24. Jesus left the temple and was walking away when his disciples came up to him to call his attention to its buildings. Do you see all these things, he asked? Truly, I tell you, not one stone here will be left on another. Every one will be thrown down. As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately. Tell us, they said, when will this happen and what will be the sign of your coming 
and of the end of the age. Jesus answered, Watch out that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name, claiming, I am the Messiah, and will deceive many. You will hear of wars and rumours of wars, but see to it that you are not alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of birth pains. Then you will be handed over to be persecuted and put to death, and you will be hated by all nations because of me. At that time, many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other and many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. Because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold, but the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. So when you see, standing in the holy place, the abomination that causes desolation, spoken of through the prophet Daniel, let the reader understand, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let no one on the housetop go down to take anything out of the house. Let no one in the field go back to get their cloak. How dreadful it will be in those days for pregnant women and nursing mothers. Pray that your flight will not take place in winter or on the Sabbath, for then there will be great distress, unequalled from the beginning of the world until now, and never to be equalled again. If those days had not been cut short, no one would survive. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be shortened. At that time, if anyone says to you, look, here is the Messiah, or there he is, do not believe it. For false messiahs and false prophets will appear and perform great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. See, I have told you in advance. So if anyone tells you, There he is, out in the desert. Do not go out. Or, here he is, in the inner rooms. Do not believe it. For as lightning that comes from the east is visible even in the west, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. Wherever there is a carcass, there the vultures will gather. Immediately after the distress of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from the sky and the heavenly bodies will be shaken. Then will appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven and then all the peoples of the earth will mourn when they see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send his angels with a loud trumpet call, and they will gather his elect from the four winds, from one end of the heavens to the other. Now learn this lesson from the fig tree. As soon as its twigs become tender and its leaves come out, you know that summer is near. Even so, when you see all these things, you know that it is near, right at the door. Truly I tell you, this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. But about that day or hour no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. For in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage 
up to the day Noah entered the ark. And they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all away. That is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. Two men will be in the field. One will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding with a hand mill. One will be taken and the other left. Therefore keep watch, because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. But understand this, if the owner of the house had known at what time of night the thief was coming, he would have kept watch and would not have let his house be broken into. So you also must be ready, because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. Who then is the faithful and wise servant whom the master has put in charge of the servants in his household to give them their food at the proper time? It will be good for that servant whose master finds him doing so when he returns. Truly, I tell you, he will put him in charge of all his possessions. But suppose that servant is wicked and says to himself, My master is staying away a long time. And he then begins to beat his fellow servants and to eat and drink with drunkards. The master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect him and at an hour he is not aware of. He will cut him to pieces and assign him a place with the hypocrites, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. The Return of the King In Matthew 21, Jesus comes to Jerusalem as king. He cleanses the temple and then leaves. During the following few days, Jesus visits the temple and teaches the people on one of these occasions, as Jesus leaves the temple again, the disciples come to him and direct his attention to the magnificence of the building. This is the temple that had been rebuilt and embellished by Herod the Great and his successors. And John too tells us that this rebuilding project had been going on for 46 years. Jesus' reply to their wonderment is somewhat dismissive, as it says in verse, in verse 2. These things are all going to be destroyed. It is probably evening time as they are going back to stay with Mary, Martha and Lazarus at Bethany, but Jesus pauses and sits down on the Mount of Olives overlooking the temple. The disciples come to him bewildered by Jesus' dismissive comments on the temple. They ask him a question that is clear in their minds, but which is actually rather confusing. They mix two events together which are separated by millennia. So let's start by separating the two elements. The first part of the question is simple. When are these magnificent buildings going to be destroyed? The second question is, what will be the sign of your coming into your kingdom and of the end of the age? In many senses, these two questions are not linked. But you could legitimately argue that the destruction of the temple and of Jerusalem is linked to the Jews' rejection of Jesus as the coming king. It brings to a formal end the sacrificial system which pointed to Jesus as the ultimate sacrifice. But with the real completion of the sacrificial system on Good Friday, Jesus would rise again and would return to heaven to claim his kingdom. Then, one day, the second question will become relevant as Jesus the King returns, not just to cleanse the temple, but to cleanse the whole of creation, to, to claim his new remade kingdom. And so chapter 24 deals with the answers to these two questions. Some say that the answer to the first question is given in verses 4 to 25. 
And the answer to the second question is given in verses 26 to the end of chapter 25. Now, we don't have time to go through uh, the whole of these cha two chapters in detail, but first we have a knotty problem to resolve. Look at verse 15. So when you see the sea standing in the holy place, the abomination that causes desolation, spoken of through the prophet Daniel, let the reader understand, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Matthew has interjected into Jesus' answer by referring his disciples, by referring his readers to Daniel chapter 9, verse 27, where the, the vision given to Daniel refers to the establishment of an abomination that causes desolation. At the second temple. In chapters 11 and 12 of Daniel, there is a repetition of this phrase. These references are typically taken as referring to when Antiochus Epiphanes set up an image glorifying Zeus and asked for pigs to be sacrificed on the altars in the temple, acts that were to trigger the Maccabees' revolt. All that was centuries before the time of Jesus. So we are left with a bit of a conundrum. Jesus is apparently referring to something that has already happened, as though it will happen again. And indeed, in one sense, it, perhaps it did. In AD 70, the Romans destroyed the temple. So Jesus is probably linking the Roman desecration and destruction of the temple uh, with that of the Greeks centuries earlier. Therefore, we do see history repeating itself. Perhaps, therefore, we can't totally dismiss these early verses of chapter 24 as simply referring to the uh, destruction of, the, of Jerusalem and its temple. Perhaps there will be similar events in the final days that the enemies of God will again attack Jerusalem uh, in the end times. But after that somewhat long introduction, we're going to look at three points today. Jesus is coming again. Second, we don't know when. And then we must be ready. So first, Jesus is coming again. In verse 30, Jesus says, Then will appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then all the peoples of the earth will mourn when they see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Jesus is predicting his own return. But in the Old Testament, there are predictions of a day of judgment and reward. Now, of course, we don't have time to go through uh, a survey of the entire subject. But, for example, uh, I just picked out Isaiah 13, where we see a day of judgment on Babylon. Verse 6. Wail, for the day of the Lord is near. It will come like destruction from the Almighty. Now, this, of course, could simply be a judgment on Babylon of the Old Testament times. But when we get to the New Testament, and Revelation in particular, we find Babylon again as a picture of the world. In the same way, we see in chapter 22 a prophecy about Jerusalem. Verse 5 says this, the Lord, the Lord Almighty, has a day of tumult and trampling and terror in the Valley of Vision, which is a, a term which is used to refer to Jerusalem. A day of battering down walls, of crying out to the mountains. But as we've already seen, some prophecies seem to have a repeat effect. So maybe again there will be a day when Jerusalem is battered down. In contrast, Isaiah 60 proclaims a day, a year of the Lord's favour. And verses 19 and 20 say this, The sun will no more be your light by day, 
nor the brightness of the moon shine on you. For the Lord will be your everlasting light, and your God will be your glory. Your sun will never set again, and your moon will never wane and no more. The Lord will be your everlasting light, and your days of sorrow will end. So not only is this a day of God's favour, but of a different creative order, unlike anything that we have ever known. Jesus also spoke of his own return. In Matthew 16, verse 27, he says, For the Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory with his angels, and then he will reward each person according to what they have done. And in John 14, 1 and 3, he says, Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you may also be where I am. But this is also a theme of the epistles too. 1 Corinthians 15 is the famous chapter on death and resurrection, and Paul states in verse 24, Then the end will come, when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father, after he has destroyed all dominion, authority and power. In 2 John verse 7, John speaks against those who deny the return of the Lord. I say this because many deceivers who do not acknowledge Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh have gone out into the world. Any such deceiver, any such person is the deceiver and the antichrist. And of course the climax of the book of Revelation is the return of the Lord in judgment. But not only in judgment, he will bring eternal blessing to all his people. So the return of Jesus is clear throughout Scripture. Even at his ascension, the angels spoke to the disciples about the return of the Lord. To deny the return of Jesus of Christ is to deny the truth of Scripture. So, secondly, when will the Lord return? More than 50 years ago, my older brother and sister and I went to the evening service at church. Dad was preaching somewhere else. Mum was at home looking after our younger brother and sister, who were too young to attend the evening service. It was just after Christmas. I can clearly remember the speaker saying, I don't believe we shall see another Christmas. I believe the Lord will return before then. It shocked us somewhat, although I think I had a degree of scepticism even as a young te teenager. But I also remember in the mid-70s when I first worked in London, there was a man with a, who walked up and down Oxford Street wearing an old-fashioned type sandwich board which said, The end is nigh. And if you turn to Revelation 22, the last chapter in the Bible, the words of Jesus in verse 12 are, Look, I am coming soon. And again in 20, verse 20, Yes, I am coming soon. Even in the early church, there was a belief that Jesus would come again soon. James 5, verses 7 and 8. Be patient then, brothers and sisters, until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crop patiently waiting for the autumn and spring rains. You too, be patient and stand firm, because the Lord's coming is near. Hebrews 10 verse 36, sorry, verse 37, refers back to Habakkuk 2 verse 3, when the writer says, For in just a little while, he who is coming will come and will not delay. Despite the, the use of terms such as soon, the Lord has not yet returned. Many might say that he is delayed, but see what Jesus says in verses 37 to 39 of Matthew 24. 
as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. For in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, up to the day Noah entered the ark. And they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all away. That is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. The people of Noah's day watched Noah building the ark. It said that it took him a hundred years. His work and witness spoke of a coming judgment and the potential for safety, of rescue from coming disaster. But the people ignored the message. They just carried on in their normal daily lives, and so they were caught out when the rain and the flood came. That is why the warning is given in verse 42 to keep watch. Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know on what day the, your Lord will come. It is repeated, it's a repeat of the warning of verse 36. But about that day or hour no one knows, not even in the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Now that may seem surprising, and we do not fully understand what that means, so we have to take it at face value. Yet down through the ages, people have tried to predict the return of the Lord. Notably, the Jehovah's Witnesses. They predicted that Jesus would return in 1874. Then it was going to be 1925. And when that didn't happen either, they decided that it already happened in 1914, but that Jesus was only given his kingdom and hasn't actually yet come to claim his kingdom. Sadly, we have a neighbour who is generally a lovely Christian man, but he has written a book saying that he has calculated when Jesus will return, and probably sometime about the early mid-2030s. This is a denial of the truth of Scripture and risks leading people astray. The danger is that people will think that they have time to, before the Lord returns. Or when it fails to happen on the due date, they will be like the people of Noah's day. They will decide that it's not going to happen. Nowadays, we lock the doors and windows when we leave home. Perhaps we even have a burglar alarm to, to protect our home and property. But these days, thieves are also getting more sophisticated too. They steal cars without the key. They use uh, uh, deceit to rob us uh, through our banks and so on. But if we are wise and alert, we can still defeat the thief. Things were much simpler in Bible times, but still there was the need to keep alert. Jesus uses this example to warn the disciples in verse 43. But understand this, he says, if the owner of the house had known at what time of night the thief was coming, he would have kept watch and would not have let his house be broken into. Jesus is telling people to be watchful because he will return unexpectedly just as a thief comes when we are not prepared. Verse 44 is a verse that is familiar to me. It's the motto of the SASRA, the Soldiers and Aviators Scripture Readers Association. So you also must be ready, because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. It gives its name to the uh, SASRA magazine, Ready. And when I was a, uh, worked for SASRA, I remember Scripture readers telling stories of soldiers dismissing the message of salvation, saying that they would think about it a bit nearer the time as they got towards their death. One scripture reader would make a point about this by getting out his diary and asking the man, well, when are you going to die then? I'll come and see you and talk to you about it then. But even if we die before the Lord's return, we equally need to be ready because we do not know when we will die. 
Recently, there was a man and his family got on an aeroplane to travel to a wedding in Australia. About 12 hours into the flight, the aircraft suddenly dropped dramatically. The man, like many, the man was tossed out of his seat and some of them hit their heads on the ceiling of the aircraft. The drama caused this man to have a heart attack and he died. Just like the people of Noah's day, he was swept away in a moment unexpectedly. And that brings us to our last point. Be ready. Be ready for the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. The return of Christ will be a surprise. And indeed that is the theme of the parables used in Matthew 24 and 25. The unfaithful servant in verses uh, uh, 48 to 51 of Matthew 24 is not ready for his master's return. And consequently he is cut to pieces and assigned a place with the hypocrites. Chapter 25 starts with ten bridesmaids. Five are ready for the arrival of the bridegroom and get their places at the wedding supper. Five are described as foolish and have no oil for their lamps to light the way for the bridegroom when he comes in the night. They are left outside of the wedding festival. Though they knock to gain admittance, they are left outside. In the following parable, the servants are given bags of gold to serve their master in his absence. When the master returns, the servants are treated differently according to their service during his absence. The one who does nothing is thrown out into outer darkness, while the others are rewarded with positions of authority. And in the third parable of the separation of the sheep and the goats, those who have failed to serve God will be bewildered by the judgment against them. They have not treated God well because they have, not, they have failed to care for his people. They are not ready to meet God on his terms. They want to be judged by the criteria they set for themselves. But instead, they go to eternal punishment. <clears throat> Today there are people who believe, like the preacher 50 years ago, that the state of the world is such that it must surely indicate the imminent return of Christ. Maybe they are right, but maybe not. There have been periods of turmoil in the past that prompted people to think that the return of Christ was imminent. Think of the Great War, World War I. The recapture of Jerusalem caused many to think that this was an immediate precursor to the return of Jesus. And undoubtedly things have got much worse since those days. Wars are going on all around the world. I heard the figure recently of 43 different wars, which probably includes terrorist activity. And in recent years, there have been a number of big earthquakes. And this is referred to in Matthew chapter 24, verse 7, along with famines. It's therefore a serious probability that Christ will return soon. And we should not dismiss such a possibility. But if you read Revelation and make a serious study of it, one way of interpreting it, it is that it describes a series of cycles of judgment which can become more and more severe. That would fit with the pattern of the plagues in Egypt, with the judgments of Israel in the time of the judges, and the judgments on Israel as it descended into apostasy, leading eventually to exile. The way that the plagues of Egypt are often taught to children in Sunday school probably helps to shape our thinking into believing that these pl plagues took place over a couple of weeks, when in fact they probably took place over a period of months, if not years. The destruction of the crops by the locusts could not be immediately followed a short time later by the destruction of crops by the hailstorm. Similarly, the cycle of judgments 
and recovery in the book of Judges probably represents about 400 years, a similar time to the coverage of the books of Samuel, Kings and Chronicles. We must therefore recognise that there might be many years before the return of Christ, perhaps not in the lifetime of anyone here. I leave that idea as no stronger than a possibility. Why? If you were told that you had cancer and were going to die in two weeks, that would shape the way that you lived your remaining days. The way that you plan those remaining days would be different to the way that you would plan if you were told that you had cancer and that with current treatments you would probably live another 20 years. As I said earlier, the parables of, of Matthew 24 and 25 are about the way that we live our lives. In verses uh, 45 to 47 of Matthew 24, the wise servant who serves faithfully is like those who serve industrially, industriously in the parable of the bags of gold in chapter 25. The wise servant is rewarded when the ma master returns to find things in good order. The wise bridesmaids get into the wedding feast because they were ready and they were able to light the way for the bridegroom into the wedding, wedding feast. God's people represented by the sheep in the final parable have served faithfully, not discerning the way that God was watching them. And so chapters 20, chapter 25 verses 37 to 39 has to be compared with the way that the others respond uh, in verse 44. God's people have been faithful, diligent, compassionate servants not even thinking about their sacrificial service. And so they are surprised when, when God pronounces blessing on them. But the selfish and ungodly missed the opportunity to serve God's people because they counted them as nothing. There are two aspects to this warning to be ready. First, we must repent and have faith in the work of, Je of Christ as our Redeemer who paid the penalty for our sins. We believe that he died for us and rose again to bring us to eternal life. This is the hope that we have in Christ. But secondly, if we have truly trusted in Jesus, it will change the way that we live. The Holy Spirit will work in our lives to cause us to live for Christ. We will want to live for him. We will want to serve him by doing the things that he calls us to do. The parable of the sheep and goats is particularly illustrative of that. We will want to serve our fellow Christians. We will want to proclaim the gospel so that others will be saved. In short, we will want to live as Jesus did. We will no longer be living for ourselves, but living to please God. We will be willing to take up our cross and serve sacrificially, giving our time, our energy, our money, our abilities to serve God. Living the Christian life will be something that we do day by day, not just on a Sunday. So let's draw things to a conclusion. Jesus is coming again for those who love him, for those who have confessed their sins to him and trusted in his sacrifice as their means of salvation. This is a constant theme through scripture. We do not know when Christ will return. The Bible is clear on that. So we must be ready. Being ready is not about keeping a constant watch for his return. It is not about studying the TV news or the newspaper and trying to fit what's happening in the world to scripture texts. It's not about ha going after every crackpot who declares that he is the Messiah and who has come to claim the kingdom. No, being ready for the return of, the, of Christ 
is about faithful service. It doesn't matter when Christ returns. We don't have to worry about that if we are walking faithfully, living out the Christian life moment by moment. We may not see the return of Christ in this life. And in one sense, that should make no difference to the way that we live our lives day by day. Each day should be lived as though it were our last. But it should also be lived as though we were going to live a full lifetime, our three score years and ten, as the old King James uh, Version says. Although I recognise that perhaps many of us, including myself, have already passed that mark. Grandma and Grandad are coming. The children are excited and watch at the window from early morning. Mum busies herself cleaning and tidying rooms and getting a meal ready. The children get bored and are distracted and don't see the car when it pulls up outside. Everyone is surprised by the ring on the doorbell. But Mum is ready. Her work is complete. And so we conclude with two simple questions. Are you trusting in the Lord Jesus for your salvation? If you are, then one day uh, you will join Christ in glory. Whether you die or whether you are still alive when Christ returns, we are promised that Christ will reclaim his people. Second, are you walking in God's ways? This is the sign of the true believer the wise servant of verses 45 to 47 is not worried about when the master will return because he is always walking faithfully. But the foolish bridesmaids miss out on the wedding banquet because they only seemed to be ready. But in the end, they weren't prepared for the coming of the bridegroom and they are condemned by the words, Truly, I don't know you. May we each be ready for the return of Christ. <laughs>